Today I'm going to talk a little bit about what CIFA, uh, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, are doing for students. But I'm going to do it by presenting a idea of what we might might be happening in 2020. So last week the uh, Institute for Archaeologists launched as the Chartered Institute, and as part of our launch celebration, our um, two of our committee members from our new generation group provided a vision for us of 2050, uh, of where they wanted the profession to go and how CEPA could help get there. What I want to do today is talk about where <coughs> I think we could be in terms of training and students in archaeology in 2020. Now that kind of coincides with the end of our current strategic plan for IFA, so this is things that I think tangibly could happen, but I'm not saying will happen. <laughs> but I'm hoping to show you how we might be getting there at the end as well. Um, so, a vision for 2020. There you go. That's what it is. So, by 2020, I'm going to start a little bit just about talking about what the Institute itself does. So we're a professional body. Um, our members are, we have about 3,200 members at the moment, and about 2,800 of those members are um, accredited professionals. So they're either uh, PCFA, ACFA, or MCFA members. Now, in 2020, uh, we want to achieve, achieve, have achieved professional parity. So those people we work alongside as professionals, the chartered architects, engineers, environmentalists, we will be standing shoulder to shoulder with those as professionals. Uh, and also, we'd hopefully be at the point where IFA or CIFA membership, <laughs> I haven't updated that one, uh, and registration are essential, essential demonstrations uh, and fitness to practice. So we've achieved that by 2020. Archaeologists can be chartered too. So the next thing, the thing that we're talking about now and the thing we talked about at the launch last week was what might happen next. At the moment, the institute has become a chartered institute, but it's the institute itself, if you like, that's chartered. One of the conversations we now need to have with membership, all of our members and our organisations, and also the wider profession as well, is about inferring that status of charter. In 2020, you could be a chartered archaeologist. Um, the registered organisation scheme will be a trusted, reliable and regulated. <laughs> it is already a regulated scheme. But as we've heard, I think probably throughout the conference, people have concerns and issues with how that regulation works and how it's perceived from the profession, from clients, from the people we work with. We're hoping by 2020 we will have a stable sector, which means that employees might have more choice about where they work. And if that's the case, we can start to recognise good employment as well. So we can start to see those organisations as employees that we might want to work for, rather than just having to work for because that's the only job going at the moment. When we start talking about training and about being a student in archaeology, by 2020 we're hoping there'll be more options. So it might not just be about courses and undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees. It might be about different options for training and where we might be able to direct our training to what might suit us. So, we might have apprentices. In 2020, we could have a number of our registered organisations offering apprenticeships in archaeology for 16 to 19 year olds and also for 19 to 24 year olds. So one of those routes into becoming an archaeologist could start much earlier and could start in a very vocational and uh, a working environment that means that you can be earning money while you're training. So you don't necessarily have to go and do a degree to be an archaeologist. If you do want to go and um, go into a university environment and undertake an academic degree, you might be able to choose to do that in a department which has CIFA accredited courses. So courses that are recognised by the professional body. Now this isn't a model that we would invent as the professional body. This happens in lots of other professions. So it's really about looking about how that might work in archaeology and how we might um, make it work for different types of departments and make it work for the students who might be opting to do those courses. Um, I've put some kind of optimistic figures in there, <laughs> obviously. At the moment, today, 
we have about 450 student members. And I would imagine if we did have accredited courses where students were very aware that they were taking a course to be um, professionally accredited, then that student membership would almost be part of that. It would be part of that um, understanding what it means to be professionally accredited. <coughs> Another route into employment might be going through an MVQ system. So if you're changing careers, if you're moving sideways into archaeology, or if you're um, wanting to take your learning and uh, move from kind of more vocational, voluntary sector archaeology, you might decide to take an MVQ in archaeology. You might already be employed and decide that that's a good way to record your learning as you're doing it. Um, we already know that some employers are interested in offering this and paying for their members of staff to do this. And in fact, we heard from Simon Woodyworth at the uh, launch last week about that's happening in Worcestershire right now. So these things aren't intangible and these things aren't entirely made up. <laughs> I'm not just storytelling, I promise. Um, but the, the idea that you might be able to take an MVQ isn't new. The idea it might be supported and paid for by an employer is a really positive step, I think, for um, archaeology in general. In terms of pathways to accreditation, um, we've been talking for a long time about pathways to PIFA, which has now become pathways to PAKIFA, <laughs> with, with the changing name. Um, but I think what we're really talking about is opening up different types of pathways. So it's not just about having one route in to becoming an archaeologist. It's about having options and being able to decide at different stages in your career development, but also different stages in, your, um, in how you might want to approach that career. So what kind of route could you take? There, there will be, by 2020, different options for you to be able to go from uh, being interested in archaeology to having a career in archaeology, and that's what we're hoping to achieve. One of the things that I'd quite like to look at developing is a membership grade that reflects those people. So the people that are in training, who are graduates, or who might be undertaking those MVQs. So the people who are on the pathway to becoming accredited, so kind of pre pakifa <laughs> members. Pakifa doesn't quite roll off the tongue like people do. Um, so one of the things that you might be able to do in 2020, if you were a young archaeologist like Rory here in the photo, who is, um, was on a dig with the Somerset County Council, that you might be able to decide that you did enjoy that experience in archaeology, you would like to become an archaeologist, and you could then actually look into different ways of doing that. So you don't have to assume you've got to go and do archaeology as a degree, but there might be different options to do that. And if you did go along the um, going to do a degree route, there might be ways that you could look at it and say, well, if you want to be a professional archaeologist at the end of that route, then you might choose to do different courses and you might be able to look and work out which ones to do. So hopefully in 2020, there'll be pathways which you can follow and you can decide how to become an archaeologist before you kind of make a commitment to doing uh, A-levels, degrees, different stages of that career. So in terms of what's actually really happening right now, <laughs> all of the things I've been talking about are things that we're discussing. So it's not all just um, optimism or making things up. Uh, we just released last week the um, introduction to providing career entry training in your organisation, which my colleague Kate has got copies of uh, just at that end desk there. So if you would like a copy, either pick one up or grab Kate. <laughs> and you can take one away with you. But that's the kind of uh, collation of all the information, the knowledge, the experience that was gathered through all the HLF um, and English Heritage and CBA workplace learning bursaries that were undertaken. And what that provides is a kind of an understanding of how those placements were um, taken, but also gives everyone access through the, our website, which is kind of um, the link to which is, is in there, to all the training plans as well. So if you were in an organisation and fancied learning more about uh, a particular area, there might already be a training plan in existence. So that's what that's all about, really, is giving people access to that sort of knowledge and experience. Um, we do have a new generation special interest group that was set up three years ago after the Oxford um, IFA conference. 
And that group is really specifically looking at areas that we can help support early career archaeologists in. So that might be things like mentoring, providing access to information, and providing the kind of training that isn't often given to people um, at the early stages of their career, like project management training, for example. Um, the pathway to Pakifa is something that uh, Kate's working on and other colleagues. So there are things happening right now, and a lot of that is about finding the information that we've got and making, joining up the dots, I suppose, between things like uh, CPD and recording CPD, um, national occupational standards, and what you can have access to as um, a student or somebody in the early stages of your career. We already have MVQs in archaeological um, practice, so they already exist. But we need to find ways of making them more accessible to people, I think. So getting more assessors, getting more assessment centres, and making them more visible to people and to employers as well. Uh, we are talking to people about developing apprenticeships. And we are trying to build partnerships in, in lots of different areas as well. So that's with people like University Archaeology UK, which is Scooper previously. I only found out yesterday they changed their name, um, but also talking to individual departments about things like accrediting courses and, and also registering with us as registered organisations. Um, we've been talking to the CBA and we offered the joint membership for students, um, which I think has just finished, but I think we're going to try and run it again. Oh, it's not finished. You can get it today. You can get it today. <laughs> um, so you can get a joint membership of both organisations together. And we've also been talking to uh, David from Badger and to Manchester University about the skills passports that they've been developing as well. So we're trying to kind of bring things together and build as many partnerships as we can. Um, we know that there are also graduate training schemes in the offing as well. Oxford Archaeology have just um, been advertising their most recent one, and that is linked into National Occupational Standards, and it does have a workplace learning program, so very much built on the um, little purple leaflet that you can all see before you now, hopefully. And if you can't, you can pick one up later. Um, and there's also workplace learning in place as well. So employers are paying, or at least one, <laughs> is paying for people to do an MVQ as part of their workplace learning. So these things are happening now, and hopefully in another five years' time, they'll be happening much more often, and they'll be much more embedded in the profession itself. Um, I thought it might be worth, I'm not going to talk about this for very long because this is where it gets a bit dull. This is our strategic plan. <laughs> These are the objectives for CIFA at the moment. And I think in terms of what uh, CIFA is doing and how that relates to students today in archaeology, is a lot of the work that we're doing is about building a stable career for people to work in at whatever stage in your career you might be. So in terms of uh, improving the status of archaeologists, for example, inspiring excellence in professional practice, um, strengthening relationships between different archaeologists, that de essential demonstration of fitness to practice, and developing stronger influences on the historic environment. And then, last but not least, giving you a credible and effective and efficient professional institute, which is now chartered. I don't know whether you'd heard, <laughs> but uh, something to mention. We're also going to be talking a lot about this in the future. So in uh, April in Cardiff, between the 15th and the 17th, we have our annual conference. Um, the, the subject of this conference is the future of your profession, and it's not a coincidence that that comes on the back of becoming charters, because we really feel that that has got something big to do with the future of our profession. So we'll be talking a lot about that, and we will be talking about chartered archaeologists and what that might look like as well. And that's it from me, so thank you for listening. <laughs>
um, ethos, if you like. So it should be the case that people who have signed up to be registered organisations are also signing up to the Code of Conduct. So the same Code of Conduct that we as individual members would sign up to, which is based on a Code of Ethics. It's in theory, but it, you know, it is something solid as well. So that should be something that makes things better. And I certainly in my commercial, professional experience, I think it has actually made things better over the last 10 or 15 years from where we've come from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it is better than you think, but we yeah. think there are still a lot of issues. Yeah. yeah. And as far in terms of pay and conditions side of things, um, the, I can't remember exactly when it was, Kate will probably know, back in October I think, we did release a joint statement between IFA, now it's the IFA, um, and FAME, the Federation of Archaeological Managers and Employers, and PROSPECT, which is the trade union for archaeology, or it's the trade union which has a branch that represents archaeologists. Um, and that joint statement basically tried to outline, um, these are the different areas, this is what we all agree on, as a professional institute, a trade union and a trade association and then what uh, we provided on the back of that was a kind of action plan of what we specifically are doing which you can find on the website, I'm afraid I don't have it all in my head. <laughs> so we are working on trying to clarify what our role as a professional body is in pay and conditions and in other, I think actually... That, that was also kind of, yeah. I guess, more of what my question is, is, is that part of your remit to work on that aspect of... I think is it, traditionally looking at what a professional institute does, actually no, it's not top of the list. Okay. But as because it's something that the trade union should do, but we know that in archaeology not everyone is a member of a trade union. And we also know that to achieve a good quality, um, happy professional environment and stable careers and um, people who feel that they're genuinely in a profession that they want to stay in and they feel like they are employed by people who deserve their employment, then yes, of course, that's got something to do with what we do. We do have a role within that, but we need to be very clear what that role is against what the role of a trade union might be or a trade association, because they do have very different um, performing roles. Um, I've got two points really. Um, one thing I would like to see, I think, and I think quite a big gap at the moment in CIFA, is that um, we've lost, uh, this is not the forward of CIFA, but, but we've lost this link between universities and the profession. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the ways that we could actually bring that back is through the uh, registered organisation scheme. And what I would like to see is that to become a registered organisation, you should have a proven link with a university or, or an institute, maybe a sort of like British Museum, something like that, so that you actually, the, the organisation as well as being a kind of business, is showing sort of respect for the discipline. And I mean, that could, that could be all kinds of links. It could be student placements, it could be, you know, organising specialist services from university. It could be a whole range of things. But I think that's something that the IFA could actually, when you're talking about promoting links, that could be something that actually they could do, which which formalises, in a sense, brings back sort of universities and, and, uh, and the profession together. Yeah. Uh, but the second thing is that I, one thing that does worry me, and I was at the HGM last week, is that there does seem to be a trend, and um, I, I think perhaps the, the IFA has a dichotomy here, of kind of lessening the academic aspect of archaeology, this idea of people coming through as apprentices, etc., etc. Um, I, I don't think this is a good thing, and, and, and one of the main reasons for it is that I think it ignores, uh, it looks at Britain, the UK, as a kind of the place where archaeologists work, but of course, you know, we're part of a much wider community, a European community, for example, you know, which has ten times as many people, potentially ten times as many jobs for archaeologists, mm -hmm. and, and we are not going to get jobs outside of the UK unless we have academic qualifications. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. An MBQ is not going to do you any good if you try to get work in Scandinavia or Germany or France or Spain, plus all the other problems as well. We do have to kind of find this benchmark of academia, academic qualification, which is at least level across Europe. And we have to be saying, as you pointed out, you know, the young boy in the trench needs to know at the age of 12 or 13 that getting an apprenticeship at 16 might get him a job in, uh, in Worcester. It's not going to do his career much good, though, if he's excluding himself by not having a degree, not having a master's, from looking for jobs outside of the boundaries of the UK. And I think that's a, that's a really big danger. 
there is one thing that is in the gender, there is a brother's technical There is, and there is an island as well, the gender system. But it's not an archaeologist, and it's, you know, it's working under, you know, well, would they would those be compatible? Would you, I, if you linked up, so no. if you linked up, yeah. can I can I just answer first, Mark? Is that okay? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, I think the <laughs> you can come in at the end. Um, I think in terms of the first point, I would actually like to see more academic departments being registered with the IFA, the IFA as we are, and I think that's one of the not necessarily in exactly the same scheme, but maybe one of the benefits of having this conversation about accreditation of courses is what will help those sorts of things. I do think it'd be brilliant to have more um, partnerships between organisations, commercial organisations and other types of organisations. But I don't necessarily think, and, and again this is a personal opinion, that the professional body should be forcing that on the sector, if you like. Well it wouldn't um, be forcing it, because I mean, you know, the registration is a voluntary scheme. Nobody forces yeah. a, a company to join it. They choose to do it on, on, the, on the terms that you set out. Yeah. Right? So I mean, if you said the terms that we set out is we are an academic mm. discipline who happens to have a professional mm -hmm. uh, sort of front end, if you want to subscribe to this, then you, mm. you achieve both of those ends. You have an academic credibility as well as a professional yeah. credibility. Yeah, well, I don't know whether that, I know. that's I not how I would see it. I know they would hate it. So, so force <laughs> it on them. Mm -hmm. I can see that uh, this is going to lead to a discussion. That's yeah. really good, but I think yeah. perhaps we should save it for that. Does anyone have any specific questions at the moment? Can I just finish yeah, that one point? It was just, on the, just the point about the um, the NVQs and recognition elsewhere. I don't know that, to be honest. I don't know, and I'm sure Mark was probably going to tell us something about it. But one of the things that I would bring it back to is the whole idea of all of these different pathways is that you end up being an accredited professional, and that's what gets you a job in another country. No, so it what doesn't. It doesn't. Sorry, it doesn't. Yeah, but maybe it, not today, but it is no, recognised. It's not people. going to tomorrow, honestly. I mean, Mark will probably know that if he, you know, he comes from a, a wide... Well, the MVQ, as we call a different uh, industry, you know, still discussing the same but... Uh, different training. MVQs uh, are uh, getting into the charge We are people with, have people there without academic skills who go to work. Well, our university to get the formal paper after having worked 10 years or so. We have got Germans coming in and our school. Uh, the biggest obstacle to work outside your own country is in yourself. At the heyday of, of, of uh, archaeology in, in the Netherlands, we had 50 people staff outside of Europe and they were well off and they all, most of them, 40% uh, at least, went up because they wanted to be close to the workers or didn't like uh, what the Dutch were doing or whatever. Of all those people, three stayed and are well off, had different career uh, options there. They're in the work <laughs> system, and not all of the three I know had a formal thing. And it is very different all over the place, and I know it's a difficult in Scandinavia, but it is, there are good non academic uh, archaeologists still in working in France. And so, yes, there are. I've worked with them. Uh, they have led to excavations, so they are rare because it's not so common to do, but there are possibilities. And these possibilities are growing because Bologna is not only about uh, universities, but it is also opening the European market. So there are all kinds of things, and there are disliked at many places to work over a local place. And of course it's hard, of course it's difficult, but it is there. Just uh, the letter convention, you know, letter says that you will be qualified archaeologist. It doesn't say that you're going to be an experienced archaeologist and say qualified. That's, yeah. that's what the European government is thinking. Did you have a, a question? Yes. Um, I have two, actually. Uh, you have a lovely set of potential future possibilities mm -hmm. that you've got set in plan for 2020. What exactly can you do mm -hmm. by the end of next year? Well... What, what, how will this affect me in the next year, leaving my master's degree and wanting to enter into the profession? Because I've looked on various websites mm -hmm. and I've, I've tried to find potentials for professional uh, CPD training mm -hmm. um, in the local area. I've looked for, there's the discussion about the skills passport, which Manchester has one of, yeah. but we need the production potentially of a bigger one that's more encompassing of like, skills. David, yeah. I think David, that's a good <laughs> which is being worked on, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's when that comes available, it'll be great. <laughs> But what, what can we expect in the next two, two or three years? <laughs> well, I think that the things that are already in place, like um, the stuff that... The stuff. Kate's been working on the pathway keeper stuff. Now that's really going to be aimed at um, 
people currently doing degrees and helping people think about what they're learning and how they can record what they're learning. And it all ties in together with things like the skills passports. So helping people uh, not do it, you know, but helping people think about what vocational training they're getting. Because you probably are getting some. It's not that it doesn't exist, but I think people maybe aren't recording exactly what they're doing. And as far as employers are concerned, if you see that somebody's got a degree, you don't necessarily know what that means, unless you know. And I think that's why, in some cases, um, you tend to get link-ups between particular organisations tend to take students from particular departments, because they know what they've learned, and they know what kind of field training they've done. Um, one of the things that Kate has been working on more recently is endorsing <coughs> field training courses. So again, it might not help you in the position that you're in now, but current students um, and students who are looking <coughs> at undertaking field training schools. I would think probably by the end of next year there will certainly be more visibility of field training schools that have a kind of... Um, they have been endorsed by CIFA, which means we'll have looked at national occupational standards so you'll be able to see before you do that training course what the learning outcome will be and how it ties in. One of the things that I would really like to see and I don't know whether that will happen or not but with the kind of those building relationships with things like linking in with skills passports that are currently being talked about is having a conversation with our registered organisations about how they're going to recognise people who are holding <laughs> a skills passport and if they're going to be taking them on on a short term contract how are they going to enable that individual to walk away to their next contract having learned something? So those are the kind of more tangibles, I think. I mean, there are, there are other things as well that I just can't think of at the moment. But um, these aren't things... That, that, that vision for 2020 is where I think we, we, we can be in 2020. But it's all based on stuff and conversations that's happening now. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I can see there's going to be quite a bit of discussion, uh, and I'm afraid we'll have to save it for them. Uh, we might also have to knock a couple of minutes off. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have our next speaker now, please. Uh,